What is up you guys, welcome back to the channel and in today's video I'm gonna show you how to build a complete Python Pi game, blackjack game, start to finish. You don't need any outside images, sound effects, fonts, anything. It's all within the Pi game and Python modules. All of the code is available for download at the GitHub link you can find in the description of this video. And we're gonna go line by line through how to make this entire game. If you're not familiar with the game Blackjack or some places just call it 21, uh, I'll simply go over the rules really quickly here. Um, when there's no active hand, the round starts by every player and the dealer getting dealt two cards where the players can see their cards and the dealer turns one of their two cards face up. The player checks their score and has to decide what to do based on their current score. If at any point you get 21, that's blackjack and it's essentially immediate win unless the dealer also gets 21. But basically, you want to get as close to 21 as you can without going over or busting, where 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9 are just the value of the cards that they represent. 10, Jack, Queen, and King are all 10 points, just flat 10 points. And then an Ace can be a 1 or an 11. So you can use that to sort of get you close to 21. But if you end up over, but you have an Ace in your hand, it can represent a 1 instead. And then really the main two things that a player has to decide to do on their turn is to either hit or stand. Hit is you get another card and you sort of do the whole process again. Stand means your score is as high as you want it to get that round and you're prepared to play against the dealer. Once you stand or you get 21, the dealer then reveals their score and they are required to keep drawing cards until they're 17 or higher. Some casinos have a special rule about what to do when it's an ace and a six. This is called a soft 17. I'm not going to get too into the specific weird scenarios of blackjack because this is about Python and not blackjack, but obviously you have to have a moderate grasp on the game to understand what we're doing in the program. And the program that we're going to build is really cool. It's going to let you hit and stand and deal and uh, play against the computer and it'll keep track of your total record of wins, losses, and ties against the computer. So it's a really fun app. It doesn't take very long to build. It's pretty straightforward. And again, I left all the code and assets you'd need in a GitHub in the link in the description of this video. So check that out. If you want to follow along with the video, follow along with the tutorial, but let me know in the comments if you have any questions or what you want to see more of on the channel in the future. And I hope you like it. Check it out. Thanks for watching. All right, let's get going on this tutorial. And first thing we're gonna do is import the modules we're gonna need for this build. And you can do these one at a time as we're going through the project. Um, but essentially, if you know you're gonna have some sort of RNG, like in this case, shuffling the deck, um, and we know that like we're gonna wanna be making copies of the deck every time we play a new game so we don't overwrite our original deck, then we wanna import copy and random in the beginning. And then because we're using Pygame as the graphical user interface, we're gonna import those three right in the very beginning. So um, your import statements will always go in the top and then we'll put the game variables kind of second. And um, first thing let's do is let's actually set up what like a deck of cards would look like. So let's just go ahead and make a list of all the cards that could be in a deck. Two, three, four, five, six. And I'm actually making them strings because uh, it doesn't really make sense to make them integers. Seven, eight. Um, because the obviously jack, queen, king, uh, and ace have letter values. Um, so they do have numerical values that end up getting represented in the game but we're going to handle that a little later and just make the deck of cards look exactly like a uh, uh, the letters and numbers that you'd see on the cards and then we're going to say one deck is equal to four times cards and we don't have to worry about shuffling it here and this like little code right here is actually super nice it's just gonna take the whole list multiply it four times and stick it in a uh, list called one deck and then we're gonna have a function in this because real blackjack, uh, they use a varying number of decks to kind of determine how difficult um, it would be to card count. So I guess this is an optional step. You could just always do it with one deck, but there's this feature in blackjack where they're gonna play with like four decks or eight decks or whatever. Um, and so to use that, we're gonna say like, 
uh, dex is equal to however many dex we want to use. And then that's kind of nice because then what we'll do is when we actually like um, reinitialize anything, we're gonna say that the actual game deck is equal to, um, and then we're gonna make a deep copy. So copy, deep copy. And this is how we make sure that that's an original list. And it's not looking at the same pointers that our original list has. And that way, if we overwrite the game deck, we're actually overwriting the base deck of cards as well. That would be bad. So we're going to do this copy, deep copy, and then decks. So however many decks we want in our game times one deck. And now this is going to give us a list of um, however. So let's go ahead and actually just show it show rather than tell. Uh, if I print the game deck now, and let's say we just have one deck initially, and I run this, um, then whoops, and I run this, there we go. Then what you'll see in here is I have two through ace. And if we kind of keep an eye on it, this is the second time we have it here, two through ace. And then the third time we have it two through ace. And then scroll the right a little bit, we have it one more time. So we basically get one deck of cards, right? But if we change decks to two, and I run this again, I'm not gonna bore you guys like counting through all the twos, but there's one, two, three, and if you scroll to right, four, five, six. Okay, so you can see we're getting two decks. Now a full blackjack minimum at a casino, or say, is usually minimum four decks. So you can scroll to the right and you can see this is obviously a pretty huge list now. That's actually how it becomes difficult to card count because of all these different cards. Um, so we'll say four decks, that's fairly standard, but um, that's just a little bit of blackjack trivia. It's a little less <laughs> important about uh, programming. But that's okay, now let's get into actually setting up a Pi game window. And to do this, um, I'm gonna do like kind of a nice little phone app sized screen and say width is uh, gonna be 600, height is gonna be 900. And then to use those, it's just pygame.display.setMode. And then we give it a size in width, comma, height inside square brackets. And that sets up our window. And then let's go ahead and set the caption of the window too. So pygame.display.setCaption. And let's say pygame blackjack, just like this. Okay. And now let's go ahead and uh, do some just basic setup of game variables we'll need. So we'll use FPS of 60, that's pretty standard. Um, and that's gonna control the rate at which our game plays. And then we need to set up a timer or a clock that will actually use that FPS. So to do that, it's gonna be pygame.time.clock. Uh, and then that should be enough to just kind of get started here. But what we'll do in the very beginning too is we'll set up a font, um, pygame.font.font. And I'm gonna use Free Sans Bold. People who've been around the channel a few times know I use this a lot of the time. It's uh, one of the ones that comes built in with an install of PyCharm most of the time. So if you're using Python and PyCharm like I am, you probably don't need to import any font files or anything. Just Free Sans Bold TTF. And then we'll make it a pretty big font. We're gonna use that in most places. And if we need some smaller text later on, we'll come back and we'll make a smaller font. Um, Okay, so let's just uh, start there with our basic setup, and now let's get into the fun stuff. So let's say run equals true, and this whole area, I kind of call this the main game loop. Okay, so we'll say run is equal to true. That's just this new variable we'll use to keep track of if we're actively playing the game. And then we'll say while run, and then everything in here is gonna repeat as long as the game is running. So this code will run over and over and over again, whereas everything we've written so far can kind of be thought of like as a setup or initialization. Okay, so while run, then we want to run the game at our frame rate and fill screen with BG color. All right, so these two commands are gonna look like this, timer.tick at our FPS and then screen.fill, and we'll make the background black, but you can play around with this if you want, however you want. Um, and, uh, oop, I did forget, this needs to be screen equals pygame.display.setMode. Um, that way we can just reference uh, the screen as screen for the rest of the game, okay? And now we need to do the event handling. And the first one we'll do is uh, if quit pressed then exit game like this, okay? And we'll say for event in pygame.event.get is the code. And then we're gonna check the event type. So uh, fortunately the quit button, which is all we need to get our window loaded up, is a uh, built-in that is pygame.quit, just like that. 
And uh, you don't put parentheses after this one. It's not uh, something callable like that. And so pygame.quit colon, and if we hit the quit button, we want run to be equal to false. And then we're just gonna come outside of that for loop pygame.display.flip is a command we always put at the end of this while loop to make sure that everything we told to draw onto the screen actually gets flipped onto the screen to be drawn. And then down here, we can just say pygame.quit because this means that now we've exited the while loop, which means the quit button must have been pressed. So that's pygame.quit. And if we boot this up, oh, font not initialized. Interesting. So uh, we might need to include a line that's pygame.font.init. Um, let's go ahead and see if that fixes our problem. So right here, pygame.font.init. Yeah, I guess we need to do that. Actually, what would probably be easier is if we just did pygame.init at the very top. If there are a few things like um, anything other than just font that we want to use throughout the game, that pygame.init generically should cover all the modules, not just font. So let's do it that way. And there we go. We got our screen. And I guess uh, first thing we should do is probably take a look at drawing on the buttons. And so hopefully in the intro, I kind of talked about how to play um, how to play Python uh, Blackjack, and I don't have to explain like from the ground up how this game works. Um, so let's go ahead and um, create a function that we'll call define. We'll call this function draw the game. So basically, this is going to take a look at a series of um, what's going on in the game, and it'll draw different buttons and things on the screen based on what's going on in the game. And so uh, this should be pretty simple. I think we'll just basically say um, down here, yeah, draw game. And let's think about what we want to get back from this. I guess if we are ready for a new hand of cards, then we want there to be a like deal new cards button on the screen. But if we're actively playing, we don't want that button anymore, but we do want the hit and stand buttons on the screen. So I think we're going to want to get a list of buttons back from this function. So we'll say buttons is equal to, and then to be able to tell the function enough about what's going on, we'll want to um, kind of show whether or not a hand is active right now. So we'll pass in a variable we're gonna have to make called active that will say whether we should deal new cards or whether we are playing and we should hit or stand. So um, let's go ahead into our game variables and say initially we want active to be equal to false, right? That's what happens when the game boots up. And so this will be draw game conditions and buttons, okay? So inside of draw game, we're going to be uh, passing in some <clears throat> things that we'll say draw game and we'll say uh, instead of just active, we'll call it act in here. Um, and then we need to create this button list, right? So we need to tell um, tell the outside world what buttons it's time to uh, draw and where they exist based on whether or not the game is active. Um, so now let's say initially on startup and we'll say not active um, only option is to deal new hand right because if there, if you don't have a hand um, then you're you need to deal a hand so we'll say if not act then we're going to draw this deal button on the screen and that's super easy it's just pygame.rect.rect uh, nope, <laughs> it's pygame.draw.rect because we want to draw the rectangle on the screen. Pygame.rect.rect is how you define one without actually drawing it on the screen. And so let's draw a white rectangle on the screen and then this is gonna take four arguments. It's gonna take an X and Y starting position. So we'll use, um, I think, 150, 20. That'll be pretty close to the top of the screen, um, which is just kind of nice. And then 300, 100 is going to kind of be my standard size for buttons. So that's width and then height, 300 wide, 100 tall. And then I'm going to make this a solid rectangle by giving it an argument of zero for width. That's edge width. And uh, what we'll do next is we'll put a border on it. So you can kind of see what happens if you do want an edge width. But if you want a solid rectangle, that needs to be a zero. And then we'll put a five in this. Uh, these last two arguments are optional. It will default to being just a pointed rectangle. So the edges will be pointed and default to being a solid rectangle. 
Because I want uh, to use a rounded edge, uh, I need to also give it something for the width argument. So um, that's a fully defined rectangle right there. But let's go ahead and uh, copy that rectangle. And now I'm gonna make the same size rectangle, but I'm gonna make it green. And I'm gonna make it only three thick. So this should give me the effect of having a border around a white button. Okay, so now let's add some text to the button and I'll just call it deal text and that's gonna be equal to our font dot render. And then we'll say deal hand. So basically, you know, it's time to deal the hand and then you need to give it two more arguments, anti-alias, which we're always gonna make true because it smooths out the text. And then uh, we'll make this text black because it's going on a white button. And then we'll do screen dot blit. And then we'll put the deal text on the screen and we'll put it just inside the button. So 16550, which if you think about our X and Y starting position of the button, this will be scooted just inside um, and kind of sit nicely on the rectangle. And then we'll just do button list dot append and we'll put the deal button right on the screen. So before we take a look at what to do if it is active now um, with the hit and stand button, let's take a look at just that to make sure it looks okay. Okay, and so we boot it up and we get this nice um, deal hand rectangle and it should be the only thing on the screen right now because we're not actively playing so we want to deal a new hand, okay? You could make the game like by default deal a hand to when you boot up the program. I think it's kind of fun to get the user's interaction right away. All right, but next thing we should do is say once game started, show hit and stand buttons <clears throat> and we'll say, we'll also say, uh, and like win loss records. Um, so now let's go ahead and say do, do, do else, because we don't need to do an L if active, just the only two options for a Boolean variable are true or false. So since before we checked if not active, now we'll just say else if active. And then we'll basically, I'm going to copy all five of these lines because we are going to be now we're gonna be taking the exact same buttons and shapes and we're just gonna change the text and we're gonna change the locations. But they're still gonna be the same button shapes just to kind of have a nice like uh, game consistency. So we'll make this one say hit me and we'll call this hit text. And it may sound kind of violent like hit me, but that's what it's called, look it up. Um, Okay, and we obviously don't want in the top of the screen anymore. We want this down like where we're playing. So we'll put this uh, all the way up against the left edge and we'll put it at 700. So 0, 0700 should be good for this one and 0, 0700. And then because we want this to be inside a little bit, we'll do 15. And then I think mm, this is shorter text. We'll go 55 in. Um, and then we want this to be a little bit below 700. So we'll do 735 like that and control C. Now let's throw in the stand button. So stand is like, uh, is like, don't hit me anymore. I'm ready to take my score and I wanna see if I beat the dealer. So it's effectively like how a, a player who hasn't busted yet by going over 21 says, I don't want any more cards, I'm done. Okay, and so uh, the first one was at zero, so we'll move this one to the right by uh, 300, but we don't need to update the up or down at all. And we'll call this stand text instead. And let's go ahead and leave it at that for now. And I'm gonna, in the beginning, cause we haven't set up like that button doing anything yet. So in the beginning, I'm gonna go and I'm gonna say active equals true. And now we should be able to see our stand and hit me buttons. Yeah, and we do, and that looks pretty good. So you can kind of picture it. Um, we're going to hit or stand on our turn. And then once we stand, the dealer will make their turn and then we'll know if we won or lost. So two other things that should happen while it's active is we want to display our history. So how many times we've won, lost and pushed or tied uh, on the bottom of the screen. And then we also wanna display like what our scores are. So um, let's go ahead and make a list in our game variables area of what our records have been. So um, we'll say records equals initially zero, 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 cause we haven't played at all. Um, but this will be win, loss, and then draw, or uh, push is the way in the US a tie is um, 
referred to as a push, but uh, it's a tie or a draw. Okay, so we have this records list um, and we need to display that on the screen somehow, but we also wanna show what the player um, score and the dealer score are. So let's go ahead and make those variables as well. And we're just gonna have to pass a few more things into our draw game function now. So obviously um, it's no longer just um, it's no longer just drawing the active. We also want to draw some stuff to do with the records. Um, and that, sh that should be enough for now. Let's take a look um, at how we want to use that stuff. So after our buttons, let's go ahead and say button list append hit. Okay. So now we are going to be, oh, one thing we should do while I'm thinking about it is return the button list every time. So regardless of whether it's active or not active, we want to send back the buttons that the outside world should be using. And then let's go ahead and uh, call this score text, or I guess you could say history text if you wanted. But let's go ahead and do font.render, and I'm going to make this a f string. So if you're not familiar with Python, uh, an f string means formatted string, and it's just a way for you to combine strings with variables in kind of real time. Uh, and so for this, we're going to use, oh yeah, we're passing in now the record as well of the game. And so we're gonna say wins, and then we'll add a couple spaces in here and we'll say losses. And we'll add a couple spaces in here. Record one, I uh, guess I'll try to make it consistent, one, two, three. And then, We'll say draws, I think that's a little more universally known than pushes, and I don't really want to say pushes a whole bunch anyway, so I'll just call them draws. But now we have one string, and then we'll give it the anti-alias true still, and we still need to define a color, so we'll still make it white. Um, but now we can take this whole row, whoop, lost it, where'd it go? We're back. And now I'm gonna take that whole score text and just uh, blit it onto the very bottom of the screen. So screen.blit, and we're gonna put it underneath our, so score text, and we're gonna put it underneath our buttons. So uh, I'll put it at 15, so pretty close to the left edge, and then 840, pretty close to the bottom. Let's take a look at that. We should have a bunch of zeros, and you can see it's a little too big, so what we're gonna do, rather than um, worry about that, like try to move it left or anything, we're just gonna make another font, um, and we're gonna call this smaller font. And instead of 44, I guess what we'll do is we'll make it size 36, because we still want it big and easy enough to read, but we need to make sure that this full thing fits on the screen. So we'll just come back here and do smaller font dot render. Um, again, I, I try to have the text pretty big on my project, so you, uh, I'm sorry, I know it pretty much reaches across the whole line, but I want the text pretty big. So let's take a look at now, if I boot this thing up. Then yeah, okay, win, losses, draws, fits pretty good, it's in the right spot, so I feel pretty good about that. Um, and I think for now, let's go ahead and leave it here, because I don't just want to mess around drawing static stuff too long, so I'm gonna collapse draw game for now. And now we're getting these buttons back from draw game that we want to actually be able to make the game uh, active based on that. So let's start by setting active equals to false. And let's talk about how to, in our event handling, how to handle what to do when these buttons are clicked. So let's go if event dot type is equal to pi game. And now we're going to do dot mouse button up. Um, and so I'm doing up because I kind of like my buttons to work on the release of a click. You could have it on the click down if you want, that's totally fine. And then I'm just gonna say if not active, right? So if we haven't started the game yet, then we're gonna say if buttons zero dot collide point. So we know that the first button we're passing back in our list when the game is not active is the deal hand button we were looking at that we defined, so we'll say if it collides with event.position. So this is checking the point of our mouse on click release, which means we were clicked and now we're releasing it and we're over that button. Then what we wanna do is basically start the game. So we're gonna set active equals to true. But now let's think about what else we need to do. We wanna create a variable that's gonna be uh, 
the initial deal, right? So we want to basically say we had no cards. Now we want to deal two cards to ourselves and to the dealer. Um, and the reason I'm making a separate variable for initial deal versus just like a, a regular deal is because the initial one is the only time two cards would come in at the same time. Um, and so let's go ahead and do that. And now let's make sure that the hands are initially empty lists. So we could do this up top too, but this is gonna kind of be stuff that we want to do every time we reset to a new game. So what I actually think would be wisest is we treat pressing that button as like the time to reinitialize our deck. So rather than have game deck up here in the initial variables, and you can leave it there if you want, um, but I'm gonna put it down here in kind of this reset code where it's like this is code that we wanna change every time. And then because there are sort of a few different outcomes that could happen, uh, we wanna make sure that we've cleared out anything from the previous game. So we're gonna basically uh, need to go make most of these variables up top. Um, but you kind of want to think through when you're handling this stuff about what the right way to um, reset the game when you initially draw uh, deal a deal a new hand. So you'd want a fresh deck. Um, you would want an empty hand. You would want uh, the dealer's hand to be empty as well. And then you would want to set this initial deal variable equal to true. So let's go ahead and take a look at um, what to do uh, when we do an initial deal. That's probably the right way to go about this. So just to maybe test that that works, if I click deal hand, it should move to active and then my buttons should switch up. Yeah, okay, so I clicked the deal hand and it went into hit me stand and displayed win loss draw. So that little mechanic is working pretty good. Um, but obviously we haven't done anything for what to do with hit or stand, but I think it makes more sense to deal first because there's no reason hitting or standing if we haven't figured out the dealing mechanism yet. All right, so let's come up after screen fill, but I guess before buttons is probably the right way to do it. And we'll say once game is activated um, and dealt, then uh, we'll, we'll make a few things like um, calculate scores and display cards, okay? So we'll do that, but we also want to make a section for our initial deal to player and dealer. All right, so let's say if initial deal, right? That variable we set when we hit deal cards. Um, let's just make a little for loop so we don't have to copy paste. And this is probably the only time copy paste would be fine, but let's make a function called the deal cards that is gonna give us back our hand and the dealer's hand um, just by passing in what they currently are. So we'll pass in my hand and game deck and we'll, experience, we'll expect this to give us back my hand and the modified game deck, right? Cause it's gonna take one card out of the deck and put it into our hand. And then it's gonna do the same thing for the dealer, but to write this as a generic function so that we can use it over and over again, adding one card at a time to both our hand and the dealer's hand, let's write it this way. And once we do this for loop of putting two cards in each of our hands, let's go ahead and set that variable initial deal equal to false because this will mean we've finished. Um, and so obviously I'm getting the red lines under my deal cards because I haven't created that function yet. So let's go ahead and say deal cards by selecting randomly from deck and uh, make function for one card at a time. Because like I said, this is the only time in the game that you want uh, to do uh, two cards. And so that's why we have this little for loop. Um, because ordinarily, when you hit, you only want one card at a time. And then while the dealer is hitting uh, to get their score up to 17, they only want to do one card at a time. So it really makes the most sense to um, create this deal cards function to be one card at a time. Okay. So let's go ahead and define deal cards and I think we just said we were going to pass in a hand and since we don't know if it's the player hand or the dealer hand we'll just say current hand inside the function and we'll say current deck inside the function um, and now let's go ahead and select a card index so I'll just say this is which card we want and it's going to be random.randint from 
uh, basically zero to the length of our current deck, right? So select one of the cards in our current deck is basically what this is saying. I don't need that colon. Um, all right. Now let's go ahead and say current hand dot append. So our, whatever our current hand list is, then we want to draw a card out of the current deck um, at index and we'll say card minus one to make sure we never get index values that are out of range because if we um, drew the absolute maximum then it would actually be index out of range at the limits so then what we'll do is we'll say current deck dot pop and uh, the same index that we just drew out of our deck card minus one and then to see what's actually happening when we do this initial deal, I'm going to go ahead and print out current hand and current deck onto the screen so we can see values getting added into our hand and then popped from the deck. And that should be pretty cool to see. And then we just need to return current hand and current deck just like that. And so this function should give us... Um, this function should give us two cards in the dealer's hand and the dealer's deck. Uh, so why don't I do this? When it finishes up, I'll go ahead and print the uh, player hand and player deck. And we won't need to print these for very long. Oh, it's I called it my hand. Cool. Um, we won't need to print these on the screen for very long because the next thing we're going to do is take a look at actually displaying the its dealer hand. Awesome is displaying the cards on the screen. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. All right, there's nothing currently. If I hit deal hand, then uh, let's go ahead and I'm gonna close this window, but let's take a look at the console window. This is pretty cool. So we went through and we handed it an empty list and it went and grabbed a five. And now I'm guessing, I don't know how long I'll have to search, but there should be a two, three, four, six sequence somewhere in this deck now. So two, three, four, five, six. It's four decks, so this might take me a little while to find. Two, three, four, five, two, three, four, five. Dang, I got excited there. Two, three, four. I should have done this with one deck for the exampling, but I'm too far in now. It's a lost time fallacy. That's not true. I can feel the retention dropping. Please don't leave. The payoff's going to be huge. Here it is. <laughs> uh, the ace, two, three, four, and then six. So it took a five out of the deck and moved it into the player's hand, and then it removed the five from the current deck. Then the dealer got a jack, and I'm not going to search through because uh, I don't want to bore you guys, but um, it took that jack out of the deck somewhere, and then it took a four for the player, and fortunately I saw that was one of the early ones. Um, and then it took a 10 out of the deck again for the dealer. So once we did our initial deal, the player got a five and four and the dealer got a jack and 10 and the deck reduced by four cards total. So that's really cool. It's a really simple but powerful deal cards function and we don't have to complicate it any more than that. So now let's go ahead and take a look at what to do um, once the game is activated and we do our initial deal, then what do we do to actually display the cards on the screen? Okay, so let's come down here and say if active, right? Then why don't we draw underscore cards and let's pass in my hand, the dealer hand, and then we're also gonna pass in a variable called reveal dealer. Cause if you think about blackjack, you don't get to know what the second card the dealer has is until you're done with your turn. So that's kind of the mystery of the game. Uh, so initially, let's go ahead and make this variable reveal dealer, and we're going to take a look at how to set it either way later. Um, but for now, we'll just say false initially, right? And so we'll say uh, pass those three into a function that will say draw cards, and we don't really need draw cards to return anything. So now let's go ahead and go between deal cards and draw game, and we'll say draw cards um, visually onto the screen and then we're also I think we'll probably um, yeah we'll just say draw cards visually onto screen and if it needs to get more complicated later we'll make it but uh, I think this one's also pretty straightforward so define draw cards and then we're passing in the player deck the dealer deck and a reveal variable all right so first, let's just systematically, programmatically go through and say for i in range of the length of the player's hand. So this is saying for each card that the player is currently holding. 
Well, let's do something very similar to our buttons, right? Let's draw a rectangular card that has a border just because borders look kind of nice, makes it look slightly more professional. Isn't looking slightly more like we know what we're doing, always the goal. Okay, and so I'm just gonna say for the player's hands, uh, let's have him like basically holding the cards facing us. Um, and we'll start at an X position of 70 from the left edge. And then we'll move all of them uh, to the right by 70 times I, right? So this is basically saying as we go through our card list, let's move them uh, significantly to the right. This way we can see all of our cards. And then we'll say, cause these are for the player's cards. So we want them a little further down, but not all the way down because we don't want to block the buttons. So let's uh, use a Y position of 460. And then um, just like we move the cards to the right as we go through our deck, why don't we just shift them down a tiny bit? Uh, just because I kind of visually like the way this looks. You'll see the effect in just a second here. I think it looks pretty sharp. Um, and then we'll make this one solid and rounded just like the buttons. And then again, I think let's go ahead and um, make another rectangle that is going to be, let's say the player's card should have a red edge just to be saucy. Um, and then let's give it a border width of five this time. So I think that's a little thicker than we made the border of our buttons, but that's okay. It'll be cool. And now let's put whatever the ID of that card is on the, uh, so screen.blit. And then I'm going to combine my screen.blit and font.render commands here because they're pretty simple. So the text that we want to render is just the value of whatever the card at position I in the player's hand is. And then we want to anti-alias true. And then let's make this black because it's going on a white card. And now it's time for the rest of the screen.blit command, which was the X and Y position. And we want it to uh, move programmatically just like the X and Y starting coordinates of the rectangle. So it'll be 75 plus 70 times I. And then the X, uh, Y position will be 465. So again, we're shifting it a little bit inside of the initial starting position. So this was 460, 70. This will be 75, 465. And then just make sure to shift it by the same amounts so that the numbers look the same on every card. And if you think about playing cards, they all show their values in all the corners. We'll just show it on the left two sides since we'll have a little bit of card overlap and we don't want it to look too jumbled. Um, so we'll go ahead and say uh, 75 for one, 465 as the starting position for the higher up text. And then we'll say 635, a little bit lower down for that one. I also didn't touch on how I came to a width of 120 and a height of 220 for these cards, but it was basically guess and check. So I'm trying to save you a little time. You don't have to do guess and check, um, but you can if you want. All right, so before we take a look at what to do with the dealer hand, why don't we go ahead and see if that works for drawing our uh, cards. Draw cards, oh, cards with an S. Um, why don't we see if that draws the player's cards when we deal? All right, so deal hand, bam. We have a 10 and a king right, right off the bat. And if you see down here, our, our code that I left in place is printing out, we got a 10 and a king. So this is working pretty good. And you can see this neat little overlap that I, I think looks really good um, for the, for the um, two cards in a row there. So we make them 120 wide and we only move them to the right by 70 each card. And that gives us this cool overlap where we could potentially see a lot of cards all in the same row. Uh, this handles extreme situations where you might have like four aces that are all worth one point. So you just, you need to have room for a lot of cards. Okay, uh, now let's go ahead and say if player hasn't finished turn, dealer will hide one card because that's how blackjack works. You get to see one card the dealer has out of their initial two, but you don't get to see both. We're going to use a pretty similar for loop, but now instead of length of player, it'll be length of dealer. Um, but now we need to do some special stuff for uh, I zero. So what we can do first is we don't have to modify the white rectangle other than we want to change the position. So um, obviously our players rectangles were at 460. Let's make the dealer 160. So that'll just move nicely up. And before I forget, let me just move all of these up. So that'll be 165. This would become 335. And then this would also be 160. 
Okay, so we can still draw the rectangle in place because there would still be a, a two cards in there. But what we need to say is if i is not equal to zero or reveal. So now we're saying if we're past that first card or the dealer is revealing their cards, then what we can do is these guys. Uh, and then what we can do is say else, that means that we're on a card that we need to hide, right? So this means that um, that this is I zero and reveal is not true. So if you think through the situations for I in range length of dealer is gonna go through every card in the dealer's hand, no matter what, everything after the first card will always be revealed. So it'll be just like this, except instead of player, it needs to be dealer. Okay, but um, or if the dealer reveal is up, which means the player's turn is done, then we still want that first card to also have the number. But otherwise means we're looking at the first card and it's not time to reveal yet. Well, instead of uh, rendering some text of the actual like card value, let's do this cool little, um, we'll just make them question marks. You could leave it totally blank, but I'm gonna put question marks to make it pretty clear that it is the backside of the card, I suppose, or that it's hidden. And let's make the dealer cards blue just to sort of distinguish between those. So let's go ahead and hit play, deal a hand. Bam, and there you go. So we are getting um, ourselves, which we actually got blackjack here. So great job, everybody. Um, and then we don't get to see what the dealer's second card is initially, which is pretty cool. I think this is a really cool effect. Um, and we're actually, we are just making terrific progress on this. So let's keep rocking and rolling. That's kind of all we need to do for drawing the cards. So great work there. Um, and I think probably uh, we should figure out how to calculate these scores, right? So let's come back down into our if active. And we drew the cards. Let's also calculate the score of my hand, right? So we care more about that while we're playing. And we're not going to calculate the score of the uh, dealer yet. So what we need to do is say player score is equal to calculate score of my hand. And we need to make a function. Let's go down here, define calculate score. And we are passing in some hand. So again, we're gonna use this same calculate score functionality to check um, the score of the dealer and the player. So we don't wanna put something in here like player hand, we'll just say hand. Um, and so now we're calculating uh, calculate hand score fresh every time and check how many aces we have. So the only reason this gets slightly complicated because ooh, table shake, sorry. Uh, the only reason this is going to get slightly complicated is because aces do throw a little bit of complication in here. So initially the hand score is always zero. And in blackjack, the ace can be a one or an 11, whatever works best for you. So we're gonna get this variable aces count, and that is just gonna be hand dot count and check for the capital A. So this is gonna be a variable that tells us how many aces are currently in our hand. And the math actually isn't too bad. We just need to be prepared to use that value in calculating if we were gonna go over in total, can we lower our score by reducing aces from 11 to one. So if that didn't make sense, let's actually write the math and that might clear it up. It also may, it might make it more confusing, but I don't think so. All right, for I in range, length of our hand. So now this is gonna say for every card in our hand. And again, remember, um, we have four, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And I guess you could do 10, but since there's a bunch of cards that have a value of 10, we'll add that in the next one. Um, we'll say just add the number the number two total, okay? So that would mean for J in range eight, so we wanna check eight values. We'll say if hand I is equal to, whoop, is equal to our list of cards at J. So this is a neat little nested for loop that's actually surprisingly efficient. Um, that is gonna go through and just add the int of hand i. 
So because our cards are actually a list of integer, uh, a list of strings, even though they look like numbers, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, it's actually a string. And so it's really stored the ASCII value, which is you know how strings are calculated. So here we're saying uh, if our card is equal to two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, or nine, then do an integer conversion of these bad boys and uh, just add that to our hand score. So that's actually the easiest way to handle most of the cases all at once. Now what we'll say is for 10 and face cards, add just 10. So this is pretty easy too. We say if hand I in, and now we can just make a quick little string uh, list. So 10, and then this will be Jack, I am having trouble typing my punctuation, queen, and then this can be king. And so this uh, in is something we could have done here too if you prefer that. I think the for loop's a little bit faster and cleaner code, but you could say if hand in, and you could potentially even write it like this, cards zero to um, eight would be a valid way of uh, writing this same little two um, checkers here. So really it's up to you. I kind of wanted to show two different ways to check for a series of values. So let's say if hand I is in 10 Jack queen or king, then what we want to do is just add hand score plus equals uh, 10. And then one little optimization that we could do here is instead of saying uh, L if hand I is equal to ace, we could just say else because that should be the only other card in our hand. Um, so what we'll do is we'll say for aces, start by adding 11. We'll check if we need to reduce afterwards. So it doesn't make a ton of sense to check what the current hand score is for an ace and make a decision then. Because if say an ace was the first card in our hand, it would see that an ace should be an 11. But if it was the third card in our hand and it was already gonna put us over, it might think it should be a one. But we actually want to assume the maximum value and then come back and see how many aces we have and how much we have to reduce our score by afterwards. So hopefully that makes sense. So let's go ahead and say L if hand I is equal to ace. And this kind of is just me being overly cautious to make sure it's actually an ace. An else here should work fine. It should be the only other card we have. Um, but that's ultimately, that's not really making a big difference to performance of a simple little game like this. But if you are driving for optimal code, an else is probably the right thing to do there. Because then your computer doesn't have to waste processing power performing one more check. So determine how many aces need to be one instead of 11 to get under 21 if possible. Okay, so now let's go ahead and see if, whoop, where'd my mouse go? Let's, let's go ahead and see if the hand score after we have totaled every card, so we need to get out of that for loop now, shift out. This right here is going to guess the highest possible hand score that we could have, where every ace would be interpreted as an 11. And we'll say if hand score is greater than 21 and aces count is greater than zero. So basically we have aces and we've gone too high. Then let's say for I in range and we'll say from one, so we'll start at one up to aces count plus one. So if you're not familiar with for loops, um, the they are beginning point inclusive, but not end inclusive. So say aces count was one, this is only going to run once because it'll run one, but it won't run two. But if we had two aces, this would run twice. It would run for one, it would run for two, but it wouldn't run for three. So we'll say if hand score is greater than 21, then we'll just subtract 10 minus equals 10 from hand score. And to be honest, now that I'm thinking about it and I'm seeing it typed out, this can just be 
aces count, right? Because uh, that one to aces count plus one is just moving the index up by one, but we're not even using the index. So I'm not sure why that felt logical initially. Um, basically what this is saying, for as many aces as we have, if our hand score is still over 21, let's subtract 10 from it, which means we're going from a value of 11 to one effectively. Um, and so if hand score is now less than 21, we don't wanna reduce any more aces. So that's why we add that if hand score greater than 21. And then all we have to do is return the hand score. Okay, so this is how we can pass in, pass in player or dealer hand and get best score possible. All right, so that's a neat little function we drew there. And that should give us the score, but we're not doing anything with the score yet. So uh, let's see if it makes more sense to draw the score using the draw game function, um, or if we should just do, let's just do a simple little draw scores function down here. So after draw cards, let's say draw underscore scores. And uh, this should be just probably really straightforward. We're just gonna pass in the player score and the dealer score, um, draw scores. Oh yeah, it's unresolved. <laughs> I was gonna say, what, it's unresolved. Yeah, we haven't made the function yet. Okay, silly, but we have you know a lot of fun here. All right, so let's draw scores for player and dealer on screen. And let's go ahead and define draw scores, draw underscore scores. And this should be a really simple one, very similar to our other draw functions. And let's just pass in the player and the dealer now, because we'll draw both with one function. First thing we want to do, and I'll just combine my screen.blit and my font.render here again, because it is very simple. Uh, let's just do another for loop and we'll say score. And then in these curly brackets, let's say player. And maybe just to make it look a little more clear that it's our score, let's put it in square brackets inside the string and anti-alias true, and we'll make it white. Now, I think what we will want to do for the dealer score is we'll just check if reveal dealer, and since we're not modifying the reveal dealer uh, variable, we can look at it inside this function without needing to call it as a global or without needing to pass it in or return it. So we'll just say if reveal dealer, um, that means we want to see the dealer score. Then we'll do this exact same thing, uh, screen.blit, oh, I forgot to give it X and Y coordinates. Uh, the player should be at like 350 and then 400. So this will be kind of in between the two hands. Um, but then if reveal dealer, then we want uh, F score and then dealer. And then this one, we want to just be up quite a bit higher, 350, 100, like above the dealer's uh, cards, okay? And um, yeah, there's not a lot going on inside this function, but I think that's how you, your best strategy for attacking these really complex problems is to break it down into little bite-sized pieces. So let's just come on down and let's see if when I run this now, if that's all we had to do to get our player score calculated. Yeah, there we go. We have our score right here um, and it's telling us 12 and I can't get more cards yet, uh, but let's go ahead and just boot this up a few times and make sure the scores always look right. So four and Jack is 14, yep. And all right, seven and eight is 15. So I'm, cal I'm satisfied that it is at least initially uh, giving me the right score. Let's go ahead and turn reveal dealer on true just to verify that the score appears and it's calculating that correctly too. Yeah, so it's not. Oh, right, but that's because we haven't told the code uh, to calculate the dealer's score. So uh, we don't need to be upset about our draw scores function. We just need to make sure to tell it in our if active checking here that if reveal dealer is on, so let's come above scores, I think. Yeah, let's say above draw scores. If reveal dealer is true, then we want dealer score to be equal to calculate score and then dealer hand, right? So that's pretty cool. And then I think um, we'll want to 
um, say that if the reveal dealer is true, that means the player's turn is on. So that means if dealer score is still less than 17, um, then we want to make the dealer draw more cards, right? So the dealer hand and the game game deck uh, are is going to be equal to our deal cards function where we pass in the current dealer hand and the current game deck. So this may seem a little bit cart before the horse to you guys, but if you think about it, in blackjack, once the player's turn is over, that's when you get to see the dealer's second card. So that's when reveal dealer would become true. And that's also when the dealer automatically has to keep taking cards until they hit 17 or higher. So uh, there's kind of a complicated rule about some places make the dealer hit on a soft 17 where you have an ace and a six. Some places let the dealer stand on a soft 17. If you're really curious about the soft 17 variation, you can Google it a little bit and you're welcome to modify the code however you want. I'm going to make it if the dealer has a 17, even if it's a soft 17, they can stand. So this is just an easy way of saying while the dealer has less than 17 points, they need to keep drawing cards. Um, and since we have reveal dealer on true right now, when I boot this up, if their first two cards are less than 17, yeah, so look, they would have had 15, so they had to draw a third card because I have reveal dealer on. But obviously, the game's not going to start with reveal dealer on. The game is going to start with it off. And until we have hit or stood, our way to 21 or a bust or finishing our turn, the reveal dealer will be false. So then we can boot this up, deal hand. It's just our score. All right, so I think we're at the point where we can, well, one, I guess we can get rid of these prints. If you still like seeing them, you can leave them in there. Um, but it is kind of, let's go to deal cards. It is kind of uh, muddying up the console. And if I need that for other troubleshooting, I'd like to have that a little bit cleaner. All right, and so I think we should take a look at what to do with buttons if we are active. We've kind of ignored this since we put in the deal initial. Um, so now if not active, let's say else, because again, there's no reason to say else if active. That's the same thing as else in this case. Okay, but then if we are active now, then buttons zero is no longer gonna be the deal hand button, right? Because we make that list empty every time. And so when it's, uh, when it's active, then um, we all of a sudden uh, button zero becomes the hit me button, right? So then if button zero dot collide point with event pause now, and player score is less than 21. So you're not able to uh, you're not able to hit if you've already busted. And so let's create another variable called hand active. And this is gonna be different than game active. So this means that the player is actively going. And this is important because we want a variable to distinguish when it's the player's turn versus when it's the dealer's turn. So we'll create a variable called hand active and I think we'll initially set it equal to uh, false, but then when we start up a new round, we're gonna set hand active equal to true. So go up in your game variables and set hand active equal to false, I suppose. But then once we hit deal hand, we want hand active to become true. All right, and so if we have an active hand and our score is less than 21 and we click on the hit me button, then my hand and my deck, oop, my deck are gonna be equal to deal cards. So just like, uh, just like in initial deal when we dealt the cards, we are gonna deal one card for my hand and my deck, just like this. And so this is really all we have to do to say when we click the hit button, hit me button, um, let us keep playing. And now let's say L if buttons one dot collide point event dot pause and not reveal dealer. So that means we've, we're clicking on the stand button, which means we like wanna be done. Um, we are gonna set reveal dealer equal to true, and we're also gonna set that variable hand active equal to false, because that means we're done playing, basically. 
Uh, all right, so before looking at like game over stuff or looking at like calculating whether we won or lost, let's just take a look at that uh, gameplay. So deal the hand, we have 11, hit me, my deck is not defined. Right, it is called, <laughs> it's game deck, isn't it? Oh man, we were doing so good. We're still doing really good, don't let that get you down. Deal hand. All right, so I actually have blackjack, so uh, I haven't handled calculating winning automatically, but let's go ahead and stand. Stand. Uh-oh. Uh, well, you'd expect that to be working, wouldn't you? Maybe just me. Uh, so if buttons zero, collide point, and player score less than 21, and hand active. Uh... Well, let's take a look at what's going on in here. So, if not active, if buttons, let's check out our buttons list and make sure, deal cards, calculate score. We are always getting our buttons, right? Yeah, draw game, active records, buttons. So inside draw game, active, stand, oh, <laughs> dang it. Um, so this needs to be append stand because we weren't adding the stand button to our button list at all. So um, good catch everyone who saw that on troubleshooting ahead of time. You guys were probably just yelling this whole time. Pete, you forgot. You got to go back. That's okay. Let's go ahead and hit, hit, uh, hit. Yeah, actually, you can see the cool ace math there um, because it probably initially calculated this to be 26 with the ace as an 11 and then detected it was too high and needed to subtract off 10. Let's hit again. Now we've busted in the automatic game mode. This will tell us we've lost right there, but now let's hit stand. Bam. And you can see the dealer had uh, 15, played an ace, got 16, had to keep hitting, played another ace, got 17, they were done. So that's really cool. We've, we've effectively made it to where we can hit until the game's over or we can stand. So all we need to do is kind of below our generic event handling. And so this, just to recap, is um, if player can hit, uh, can hit, allow them to draw a card. And then this one is saying, allow player to end turn, which is stand. Okay, so now let's come down below our four event handling because we don't actually want an event to have to happen. And we're just gonna say if player busts automatically end turn and I'll say treat like a stand, right? Um, and so this would be hand active equals false and then this would be reveal dealer equals true. So this is why I said treat it like a um, treat it like a stand basically, because if you go over 21, um, then you want to be just like a stand. And, uh, this, we would check to see if hand is active and player score is greater than 21. So this will be our automatic, um, checking, but actually we'll say greater than or equal to 21 and we'll just end your turn. Even if you get blackjack, and then we'll handle what scenario actually happened inside a function we'll call like check end game to see uh, what situation you actually got in. So let's go ahead and do, 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 let's make that check end game function. So let's say that we are going to check end game based on hand active dealers score player's score and let's go ahead and just track what the so we want to know what outcome we got so outcome and then we'll also update our records to see like how many times we've won or lost and then um, we're going to want to make a variable that'll make sure that when the game ends we only add to our score once so we're going to need some new variables that i guess we'll call outcome and check score okay and maybe this felt like i threw a lot of variables at you all, all right at once oops add score not check score um 
a lot of variables all at once, but once we define this check end game function, it'll be pretty clear where everything's coming from. But let's just go up at the top and let's add these variables, initialize them if you will. We don't need to initialize records, that exists. But we'll say outcome initially will be zero, which we'll just take to mean like you're actively playing. And then we'll say add score is false because you only want to add something to your overall record or score um, when a game has ended. So let's go ahead and say also that when we start up a new game, that outcome needs to be equal to zero here. So again, this is kind of like initialization stuff. Let's just make sure we cover it there. And now let's come up where we're drawing, uh, where we're doing all of our functions. Let's go ahead and let it automatically reformat so they're all evenly spaced. I know my OCD programmers out there will appreciate it. And let's go ahead and say check end game conditions function. All right, so we want to define, and I believe we called it check end game, just like that. And we passed some stuff in here, right? We passed uh, whether or not a hand is active. We passed in the dealer's score. We passed in the player's score. We are sending in the uh, records, which I'll call result. Uh, no, outcome is going to be result. And then the records will be our totals. And if it's time to add score, we will just call that add. And kind of the reason for um, giving them all these different names is just so it doesn't uh, what's called shadow the name from the outside world or outside function. You want essentially different names inside your functions than you have in the outside world just to prevent confusion. So let's go ahead and check end game scenarios if player has stood and hand not active. So player has stood busted or blackjacked basically those are the three things that could end you stand voluntarily before you bust or you get 21 um, or you bust going over 21 or you blackjack which is getting 21 and we'll say result would be one will be player bust two will be win three can be uh loss by comparison and then four would be push so one and three are technically losses but they're going to happen under different scenarios so let's take a look at what those different scenarios would be okay so if not hand active right and the dealer's score is greater than or equal to 17. That is basically our sign that this is totally done. So now we'll say if player score is greater than 21, this is basically the simplest one. Result is gonna be one, we've busted. That's an automatic loss. If you're familiar with blackjack, even though it doesn't seem fair, if you bust and you're playing with other players at the same table and the dealer ends up busting, you actually lose your chips. You don't get your money back. It's not a tie. If you bust, your money's gone. So that's really straightforward. Um, now let's say L if the dealer's score is less than the player's score and the player's score is less than or equal to 21. So you can do this nice little chained expression rather than doing player score greater than dealer score and player score less than or equal to 21. Well, so this would be a situation where the player has outscored the dealer and not busted. And so that would mean that the player wins or the dealer score goes over 21. So that means dealer bust. And in either of those two cases, we win. So that's result two. Now, L if player score is less than the dealer score and the dealer didn't bust, so less than or equal to, uh, <laughs> I got ahead of myself, is less than the dealer score and the dealer is less than or equal to 21, that's result equals three. That's where we lose just by comparison. Nobody busted. And then else the result is going to be equal to four. Again, you could say L if player score is equal to dealer score. But since uh, if you were to draw this out like on a K map or a logical flow chart, the only other possible solution is a tie. Um, then the result is going to be equal to four. And now what we want to do is check and see if it's time to add something to our score, which it will be once per cycle. Um, then we'll say if result is equal to one or result is equal to three, then the totals at one, which is our loss, remember it's win-loss draw, 
Um, then we want to add one to our losses and then we'll say L if result is equal to two, then totals at zero should get one. So that's our wins. And then we'll say else totals at two plus equals one. And then we'll set add equal to false. Cause this is something that we only want to run once per hand. Um, so we'll set add equal to false. And then from this function, let's return the result, the totals, and uh, add, right? So do, do, do. Let's go ahead and minimize those guys. And we need to actually take a look at using that add score variable. So um, let's go ahead and come down back to our like game reset code we've been calling it. Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, add that add score equals true to kind of our reset code. Um, here where it'll be uh, used basically once per new hand. We uh, go ahead and add the score once. Um, so that should be everything we need for that kind of outcome end game thing. And then what we wanna do is we wanna go ahead and add outcome to our draw game because it's gonna be important for us to use the result in our uh, draw game function. So after record, let's add result. And now we want to uh, take a look at if there is an outcome for the hand that was played, this is supposed to be a comment. If there is an outcome for the hand that was played, then we want to uh, display a restart button and tell user what happened, right? So uh, what we'll do in here is we'll say if result is not equal to zero, because remember we uh, set it equal to zero in the beginning, and then once we have an outcome to our game, we say uh, the result will be one, two, three, or four. Well, then we're going to screen.blit font.render. So I've been doing this a lot this game. I'm gonna combo the text that we want with the blit command for it so I don't have to put on two rows. And I'm gonna make a results list up here under uh, add score that uh, I'm just gonna say all of the possible text I would want on the screen based on the outcomes of the game. So first I'll make an empty space. And then one is gonna be the player busted, which is gonna be like, oh no, uh, so we'll do a silly face. <laughs> And then we'll say uh, for one, that's where player wins and that'll be a happy face. And I guess let's do this all caps just to be consistent, player busted, player wins. And then uh, I guess we could just say player lost for one or three, but um, I actually think that dealer wins makes a little more sense here because neither you nor the dealer busted, they just scored better than you. And then we'll say tie game for four because that's what happens in a tie or a push. And so now we're drawing the results uh, text, but then we need to give it the other arguments required, which is anti-alias, so true. And then uh, black text. Um, black text, no, I think white because it's gonna go on black background, right? So uh, we'll do white text and then do, do, do. And now we need to give it an X and Y position. And we'll put this in the very top of the screen. We've kind of left the top banner open. Um, and now I'm gonna grab uh, kind of this stuff for the initial deal button and I'm gonna sort of steal it and uh, repurpose it for this one. So we can still say deal, deal text and append dot deal because this is what happens after that first build out of the game. Um, but we do want to change the X and Y positions, right? So rather than 150, 20, which was at the very top, let's move it down to like uh, 220, 220. And then for the text, uh, I think 250. And this will just be good to move the button sort of over top of where the dealer's cards are because we don't really care what the dealer's cards are anymore. And then let's do a second ring of a border because uh, we want this button to be really easy to see. So let's just move it three inside of both of the previous ones. So 294, and then that'll be 94, and we'll still make it three radius five. This will just give us two rings around this button, so it'll be super clear to see, because it'll be over top of um, the dealer's cards. And then let's say new hand instead of deal hand, because uh, that's um, just a little different, so we can be darn sure that we're seeing our button now. 
Okay, so we're getting one more button and we're super close to done. Um, all we have to do is basically come down to our event handling and we need to check what to do with that third button. Uh, and so we will say L if length of buttons is equal to three because that is the only time we want to, oops, length of buttons, there we go, is equal to three, because that's the only time we want to check for this third button. You won't always have it, so you can't always assume you'll have it. Um, but if we do have a third button, then if buttons uh, index two, which is actually the third button, remember it starts at zero, then uh, if we click on it, so if event.pause uh, collides with it, then we really are, we're gonna steal all of the essentially like initialization reset code from up here. And the only things we're gonna add here are just dealer score back to zero and player score back to zero, just to make sure that, uh, um, basically to make sure that we don't get some funky situation where we've reset all this stuff and like clearing out the hands should clear out the scores. It's just bare practice to, uh, just bare practice to get rid of it. Um, essentially clear those scores out. And that really should be all we need to do. Um, but we are getting one little error according to our IDE. So let's see, end of statement expected. Oh yeah, I guess I put that on the, uh, one line too far down. All right, so let's go ahead and test this out. Alrighty, let's see. So let's deal our initial hand and we've got a score of 12, hit me 13, 23, we busted. Um, so even though the dealer also busted, remember we don't get the win in that scenario, let's do a new hand again, and we get blackjack, and that's great, so now we have one. Um, here we actually got blackjack right away, so uh, we weren't gonna take any other cards, the dealer went through and we won, let's try again, new hand, 20 is actually pretty good, let's stand. And yeah, we win because the dealer had to bust. Uh, let's see, 13 will hit 16, that's a tough one. Let's stand and just see. Uh, yeah, the dealer got blackjack, we were gonna lose anyways. Um, hit me, 22, they got blackjack, we were gonna lose anyways. <laughs> hit me, 22, we busted. Man, this is, uh, you're starting to see why casinos win though. Um, see, we got 20, which is great, and we still tied, we pushed, so. Um, Hopefully this is pretty fun. Hopefully you guys like this a lot. Um, I had a ton of fun making it. I hope if you guys are interested, you grab the code from the GitHub and you can make it your own. Just to quickly touch on a few features a full-blown Blackjack app might want to add. Um, you could look into the split functionality where if your first two cards are the same number, you can split them off and treat them as two separate hands and play them both against the dealer. You could look into the double down uh, function, which would be you have to take one more card, but you can double your bet. Uh, you could look into insurance, which would be if the um, dealer had a showing face card, you get a chance to bet against a blackjack and get some of your money back. Blackjack, especially casino to casino, sometimes the soft 17 rule changes. There's a whole bunch of little details that if you're super curious, you can look into, but we for sure covered all the basics. We covered them fast and I had a lot of fun doing it. Hope you did too. Don't forget to leave a like, subscribe to the channel if you like the content. Consider supporting me at the Patreon link in the description, uh, in the link in the description of this video as well. That helps me out a ton doing bigger and better projects. Um, and as always, thanks for watching and good luck with your projects. Thanks. Bye.